Even though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, your perfect love is casting out fear. And even when I'm caught in the middle of the storms of this life, I won't turn back, I know you are near. And I will be the weak, for my God is with me. And if my God is with me, whom then shall I? shepherd you lead us you guide us you're comforted by your rod and your staff everybody sing this with us together the Lord is my shepherd the Lord is my shepherd 
He goes before me. He goes before me. Defender behind me. Defender behind me. I won't fear. I won't fear. I'm filled with anointing. Filled with anointing, my cups overflowing. My cups overflowing. No weapon can harm me. No weapon can harm me. Jesus, I won't fear. I won't fear.
God, this morning we are so thankful. We are so thankful to be in your presence. God, and as this song just said, we are not promised anything but the fact that we will never be left alone. We're not promised that it'll be perfect. We're not promised that it'll be easy. But we are promised that you make our burdens light. So God, we stand on your strength. We stand on your favor. We stand this morning in your presence, declaring that you are the answer. Let this world, let all that it has to offer fade away. Let us hold fast to the truth that your love will never fail us. It's in your name that we pray. Can we give him some praise this morning? Just declare that he is the good shepherd. Amen. But we want to tell you guys welcome. You guys can go ahead and take a seat. We want to say welcome to all of our first-time guests if this is your first time and you are here in the building, do not leave without checking in at the Welcome Center. We have a gift for you. Also, we would love all those that are here in the building or online to text to connect. That number is 985-260-8411. We are so glad you guys are here. We're going to sing another song. Hallelujah. I know I have some witnesses here today to know that God has never lost a battle. His name is Victory. He wins all the time enough to be hopeful every day. He's never lost a battle. Miracles when you move, such an easy thing for you to do. In your hand, it's moving right now. You are still showing up at the tomb of every Lazarus.
Good morning. For those who may not know me, I am Sherman McLean. I'm the campus pastor here at Community Church and I have the honor and the privilege to fill in and serve my pastor this morning. So I want to welcome you here. Um, For those that are online, you are not seeing this right now, but this is my apology to you. I don't know what's going on, but um, hopefully we'll get that up and going in a minute. But man, the worship this morning was incredible, huh? Come on. Oh my gosh, I'm over there trying to hold it together as I usually do. Those that know me know how emotional I get sometimes. And today I have the privilege of bringing the message this morning. It's a message that God has been laying on my heart for several weeks now. And as you know, we're in, we're in miracles. And do you believe that nothing is impossible with God? When we live like, when we live like God can do anything we find out just how true that is. And I hope you find out how true that is today. Let me pray for us before we get started. Father, I just thank you today, Lord, just for the privilege to come into your presence, to share your word. And Lord, I just pray that you would move me aside, calm my nerves. Lord, I pray that you would just use me as an instrument today to speak through your people. And so we just ask that you meet us here, Lord. Thank you that your presence is real. It's in Jesus' name I pray, amen. So today I want to talk to us about how God uses tough times to get our attention. And I'm going to be speaking in Judges chapter 7, but I'm going to back up a little bit just to give you some context of where we're going to jump in today. And so if you brought your Bibles or if you want to follow along on screen, you can do that as well. But I want to give you a little bit of background about the people of Israel as we talk about and see this miracle that God used Gideon to perform. And so I want to start with just a little bit of history and just let you know that Israel was a people who went through all kinds of crazy ups and downs. They went through seasons of prosperity, seasons of goodness. They went through seasons of following God's heart. They went through seasons where they put God at a distance and said, you know, we got this, God. We don't need you anymore. We got everything covered. Um, And then we see in in Judges chapter 5, we see a little bit more of the context as we jump into here, into this message today. And it says that the land had rest for 40 years. So for 40 years, the people of Israel had rest. And it says that, and God says that, you know, I'm going to give the, you rest for 40 years. And, and, and so you guys may be able to relate to that, those seasons in our life where we have blessing, those seasons in our life where everything is going okay. And sometimes when that happens, it oftentimes leads us or points us to a place of complacency. Can anybody else relate to that today besides me? Um, that's where the children of Israel had gotten to. And in chapter 6, of the book of Judges, it says, and the people of Israel did what was evil in the sight of the Lord. And so now this season of rest, this season of prosperity had led them to this lazy boy mentality where they just kick their feet up. They, they're resting. You know, they're saying, hey, the kids are doing great. All the bills are paid. Business is good. We got food on the table. God, we don't really need you right now. We can do this on our own. And so the Lord says here in, in, in a few verses down from that, he says, and the Lord gave them into the hands of Midian. And so God has got this attitude. He says, okay, you want to get comfortable and complacent, I'm going to get your attention. And he gave them over to the, to the people of Midian. And for seven years, they were oppressed. For seven years, they ran and they hid. And now the the people of Midian, I want you to understand, this is a prolific people, a prolific army. These were well-trained people. They were fighting people. Um, They were well-resourced. And for seven years, they put their thumb on the children of Israel. For seven years, they were in oppression. But God is going to bring them out of that that oppression. He's going to bring them out. And he's going to use a person And that person's name is Gideon, and that's where we're going to pick up our story today. And just to give you a little context about who Gideon is, Gideon comes from the tribe of Manasseh. And in his tribe, he was the smallest. He was the weakest. He came from the weakest tribe. Um, And so he was not qualified. And so 
he reluctantly decided that he would take up the mantle for God and be the deliverer for, for Israel. But I will say this about Gideon. He must have been a pretty good salesman because he convinced 32,000 men of Israel to join him to go into battle against 134,000 Midianites. He must have been a pretty good salesman, but I don't know about you, but I don't know that I would put very much odds on the fact that he would, able to do, he would be able to defeat these people. And so we jump in here in Judges chapter 7, and the Bible says that Jerubal, that is Gideon, and all the people who were with him rose early and encamped beside the spring of Herod in the camp of Midian was north of them by the hill of Moray in the valley. And so Gideon is here. He's gathered up his 32,000 men. He's staged. He's ready to go into battle. And God jumps in and says, ho, 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 hold on, Gideon. Hold on. We're not going to go yet. And here's what he says in verse 2. He says, the people with you are too many to give you into the hands, into their hands, lest Israel boast over me, saying, my, hand, my own hand has saved me. So let me tell you what's going on here. God has called Gideon to go out and fight the Midianites. There's 140, 34,000 of them. But God is preparing him and God is equipping him. But then God steps in and says, hey, you got too many. Can you believe it? He's only got 32,000. And he's going up against 140, 34,000. And God's saying, hey, dude, you got way too many. And God steps in. And says, we got to do something about that. Here's the first lesson that I want you to hear this morning. When God is fighting our battles, less is more. When God is on your side, less is more. There's too many of us that are focusing on who and how many are for us. Instead of too many, how and too many are against us instead of how many are for us. And listen, they're always going to be more with us than there are against us. There's always going to be more with us than against us. It does not matter who is with me and who is against me. When I have God on my side and when he's fighting my battles, that's all I need. And so Gideon here has got 32,000 men and God says, hey, we got to make something happen here. you got way too many. we got to get, got rid, get, get rid of some guys. And so, you know, I think about that. And, and so... I think about that and I thought about, you know, from the beginning of time, we see God inviting and calling people that he can shine through. Not people that necessarily have it all together, which should be great news for us today, right? But God wants to work through people, not because they have it all together, but, but, but they understand, they understand that if they don't have it all together, and they're willing to see God help them to do something special with their life. And Gideon here is faced with an unsurmountable situation. The odds are totally against him. And here's the, the principle that I want us to capture this morning. If you don't get anything else today, I want you to get this. God wants to demonstrate his strength through our weakness. God wants to demonstrate his strength through our weakness. God shut it down in Gideon's life and he said, hey, bud, we're going to cut this thing back because if you win, you might think you had something to do with it. You might think that there's something that you did to cause this victory. So many times, so many reasons that you and I lose battles in our houses, in our homes, in our families, in our life, it's because we want to get the glory instead of giving God the glory. And when you want to give God the glory, you will always end up in defeat. Yeah, you might win a few battles, but you're going to lose the war. You might win a fight with your husband or your wife. You might be able to turn things in such a way that you feel good and you got your way, but your, your marriage is a mess. You might win a battle with your friend, but you lose your friend. You might... Stand up at work like you're some kind of big shot and lose your job. And I want to ask you a question. When is the last time 
You went into battle, and your goal was to see God get the glory. When is the last time that you had a struggle in your life? When is the last time that something happened, a major problem came up in your life, and the first thing you did was say, God, whatever it is that I need to do, I want you to have the glory. I want you to get the glory. That's big. Gideon's got 32,000 guys. They got 134,000 well-trained, ready to go. And God says, hey, I don't want you to get any honor. I don't want you to get any glory. And over and over and over again, God wants to teach the people of Israel and he wants to teach us today that when we're faced with a challenge, when we're faced with a problem and a situation, stop looking through the eyes of the world and look through my eyes. He tells Gideon, here's what we're going to do, buddy. You're going to go to those 32,000 men and you're going to ask them, hey, are you scared? I want you to go to them and ask them. Look in verse 3. It says, go and see if they're terrified and see if they're fearful. And whoever is terrified and fearful, I want them to go home. So he's down to 10,000. 22,000 men said, I'm fearful. I'm out of here. How would you like to lead that group? Imagine. Gideon's got 32,000 guys. He had to do a heck of a sales job to get 32,000 guys to say, hey, I'll go to battle with you against 134,000 men who are ready to go, warriors. He's got them all pumped up. He's like, God's on our side, man. We're going to go. We're going to kill these Midianites. We're going to bust some butt. He's got them all fired up, and God comes in and says, no, not today. Not today. He said, go to them and ask them who's fearful. Go to them and ask them who's trembling. Turns out, 22,000 of them. 22,000. I can't say that I blame them. 70, over 70%, about 70% of the men that were going into this battle were not ready. 22,000 men living in fear and afraid. So many times we look at our circumstances in our lives the battles that are raging around us, the hurt that we've experienced in our past, the fear that we have about our future, and we allow it to control us, and it paralyzes us. You know what I'm talking about. You know exactly what I'm talking about. Because I don't think there's a person in this room that hadn't been in that place. But that's not God's will for us. That's not his purpose for us in this life. But 22,000 of them left Gideon. Said, man, we're afraid. We're going home. We're out of here. These people lack faith and God couldn't use them. We often see in Scripture stories like this because God doesn't use the elite. God doesn't necessarily use the super talented the super strong, but he does generally use people who have some faith. He wants us to know today, don't run, don't hide from your battles. Address your fears. They're not going to go away. The longer you put it off, the bigger they're going to get. But do it in a way that God gets the glory in your life. So 22,000 men... God sends them home, says, I can't use you. They didn't want to be there anyway. The next verse in verse 4, Lord says to Gideon, there's still too many people. There's still too many. Can you believe it? There's still too many. He's down to 10,000 now. He said, there's still too many of you. And here's what we're going to do. Here's what we're going to do. God says, I'll test them for you. So, so they watched 22,000 go home, and now they got 10,000 left, and God said, you still got too many, but let me test them for you. And in that scripture, he says, I'm going to tell you the ones that are going to go with you, and I'm going to tell you the ones that's going to stay. I'm, I'm sorry, the ones that are going to go home and the ones that are going to stay. And then he says, in this scripture, he said, so he brought them down to the water. And the Lord said to Gideon, everyone who laps the water with his tongue as a dog laps, you shall set those, you shall set them by themselves. 
And likewise, everyone who kneels to drink and the number of those who lap, putting their hands, their hands to their mouth, was 300. But all the rest of the people knelt by the water. So here's the situation. Here's what's going on. God says, okay, Gideon, so we're going to have two categories. He said, over here, we're going to have the normal people, and over here, we're going to have the weirdos. And this is a good news, bad news for Gideon. He gets to keep the normal people. But the bad news is, is 9,700 of them are weird. The normal people are the ones that go to the river and they bend over and they get the water and they, they drink it out their hands. The weirdos were the ones that go to the river and put their head in the water and slurp like a dog. Now, I don't know about you, but I have never done it that way. But evidently, there were 9,700 Israelites that drank water that way at the river. God tells Gideon, the good news is you don't get the weirdos. You don't get the weirdos. That's the good news, Gideon. You're just going to get the normal guys. The problem is, the bad news, you only got 300 left. Wow. What's God doing here? He's testing. He's testing. Can you say test? Yes. Sometimes you have to go through a test if you want to be blessed. Life is a test, isn't it? And the purpose of God's test is to teach you and I to trust him more. And when we trust him more, he can bless us more. Verse 7, it says that the Lord said, okay, with these 300 men, you're going to go into battle. Um, all the rest of them, they're going home. You got the 300 and they're going into battle. And the Lord said to Gideon, and he's saying to us today, you're going to have to fight some battles in life. You're going to have some tests. And you can do it your way. And you can do it on your own. And you can get the glory. Or you can do it my way and give me the glory. And can I tell you something today? God can use 300 faithful people God can do more with 300 faithful people than he can with the 134,000 who are fearful, afraid, and self-serving. God can do more with a few that have faith than a lot that don't. You know, one of the interesting things as I studied this this week, you know, all the children of Israel, even the ones that were in hiding that didn't even come to this battle, plus the 20,000 or so that left, that were sent home, that were afraid and fearful, that didn't fight, you know, they still get to experience the blessing if, this 300, if these 300 men are successful in their defeat of the Midianites. Think about that. They're not going to experience the blessing firsthand like the 300 are going to experience it, but they're going to experience a blessing. You might be here today and you say, well, I'm part of the 300." I'm on the front line. I'm experiencing firsthand what God's doing. Or maybe you're here and you say, well, I'm, I'm part of the thousands. But can I tell you what God's will is for us today? God's will for us is that we be part of the 300, not part of the thousand. So God's assembled the team here. He's assembled his army. And God says to Gideon, one more thing. He's not done with him yet. One more thing. In verse 9, the same day, he says, Arise and go down against the camp, for I have given it into your hands. And then in verse 10, he says, But if you're afraid to go down, go down to the camp with Pura, your servant. And so God has stepped in here and called Gideon to take one more step of faith. He said, I want you to go spy on the camp. But if you're scared to go by yourself, you can take your servant, your armor bearer. Take your armor bearer with you, Pura. And he says to him, and you're going to hear what they say, and afterwards your hand shall be strengthened to go down against the camp. And so there's this picture of Gideon, and God is saying, go spy on the enemy because I have something that I want you to hear. 
Go spy on the enemy because I have something that will encourage and strengthen your heart. And it says here that Gideon and Pura went into the camp. And it says that as they got to the edge of the camp, that the Midianites and the Amalekites were like locusts in abundance. Their camels were without number as the sand on the seashore in abundance. And when Gideon came, behold, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. So an enemy is telling a dream. The enemy, he's listening to the enemy tell a dream. And then that dream, he says, a man was telling a dream to his comrade. And he said, behold, I dreamed a dream. And behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian and came to the tent and struck it. And so it fell and turned upside down. And so the tent lay flat. And his comrade answered and said, This is no other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. And God has given into his hand Midian and all of the camp. I want to remind you again, God wants to demonstrate his strength through our weakness. God knows each of us intimately. Do you agree with that today? God knows each one of us intimately. And he knows, he knew from the beginning that Gideon's fearful, of Gideon's fearful tendencies. And instead of casting him out and rebuking him, he graciously continued to reassure Gideon and cultivate his faith step by step. And God wanted Gideon to find encouragement when he went to spy on the camp. He wanted him to know that he was with him and he was going to help him in this battle. And it reminds me today that, you know, God calls us to do some hard, th- hard things in life. Um, but he's always there to guide us. He's always there to keep us and to encourage us all the way. And that's what he's doing in Gideon's life. And as a result, this is what we see in his life. When we're faced with a huge battle in life, there's beauty There's beauty and power and weakness when we allow God to fight our battles. And I want to share just three things real quick that God was doing in Gideon's life. The first thing that Gideon had to do is Gideon had to swallow his pride. It says in verse 9, arise and go to the camp. God says, hey, Gideon, you go. He didn't say the 300. He said, Gideon, you go. But if you're afraid, take Pura with you. And at that moment, Gideon had to say, hey, buddy, I want you to go with me because I'm scared. I, I want you to go with me. There's some of us today, and we need to swallow our pride. There are battles going on in your life, and you've determined that you're going to fight them alone. And deep down, you know that's not God's best for you. And like Gideon, we need to swallow our pride and admit our fears and invite someone else to come alongside us in the battle. God never intended for us to do life alone. The second thing that we see in in this text is there's power and weakness because it helps get us off our throne of our lives. It gets us off our throne of our life And in verse 11, it says, And you shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hands will be strengthened to go down against the camp. Gideon had come to a place in his life that he had to put total trust and faith in the Lord. And God tells Gideon, You shall hear what they say, and afterwards your hands shall be strengthened. What voices are you listening to today? What voices are you listening to today? Are you listening to the world's voice? Are you listening to your own voice? Or are you listening to the voices that can speak truth and love? The third thing is that the power of weakness increases our dependency. It increases our dependency. I want to share a story about my little baby girl, Emma. She's my two-and-a-half-year-old granddaughter. And for those of you who may not know, we live in an elevated house, and so we have lots of stairs. And Becky and I are very intentional with our baby girl when she is with us, especially around our stairs. 
And Emma is at a point and at an age now where she's starting to understand independency. Um, she is starting to understand free will. And there are many things that Emma wants to do, and she just doesn't want help doing it. Um, and one of those is those stairs. And she has this saying that she loves to say when she doesn't want help, when she wants to do it on her own. And she says, no, my got it, or my do it. She says, my do it. And, and most of the time, it's cute, and we want Emma to learn how to do those things on her own. We want her to let her go up and down the stairs at some point. But right now, it's not negotiable. She needs our help. There are times when she will we'll reach out to hold her hand when we're going up or down those stairs, and she'll push our hands away and say, no, my do it. My do it, Nan. My do it, Papa Bear. My do it. My do it. She has no idea the pain and the hurt that will be inflicted on her if she slips and falls down those stairs. And there are times when Nan and Papa Bear will let her do it on her own, but we're always right there to catch her in case she slips. I was reminded as God reminded me of that little girl. She teaches me so much about life and love. But, but God reminded me this week, you're a lot like Emma. You're a lot like her because there's times in my life when I come into circumstances and challenges that I say, no, God, my God, it. my God, it. And then things get messed up and things doesn't work out the way we expected. And God's always there in those moments to say, exactly, I'm here for you. Listen, every time you think you have it nailed in life, every time you think you've moved to a place, you've moved further away from being where God wants you to be to use you for his glory. And the beauty and the power of weakness is that it increases our dependency. And if dependency is our goal, then weakness is an advantage. Here's what God knew about his interaction with Gideon. And his interaction with us today, the more he takes away, the closer he draws us to his heart. Did y'all get that? The closer, the more he takes away, the closer he moves us to his heart. And when he does that, that's the best thing that he can give us. And here's the part we don't like. If he must take away to draw you closer to his heart and his goodness and in his grace. He's too good a God not to do that for us. And for some of us, we're in this position this morning and life is a mess. And I hope our eyes are open to a God who is saying to us today, like little Emma would say, my do it, my do it. Let me help you. You've tried it on your own and it's failed you. There's power in weakness. There's beauty in weakness because it can lead us back to the Lord. You know, there are people, even in this room and online, and I talk to them all the time, and you're walking through some insanely difficult seasons. <laughs> Insane. Even this week, I heard a testimony from a, a man who said that for the first time, I am beginning to see God work in my life in the battle that I'm in for the first time. I said, why? He said, because I found that <clears throat> I found that I had nowhere else to turn. I had nowhere else to turn. I think that's a great lesson for us today. And it's simply this. Don't wait for all your resources to be depleted before you turn to the Lord to help you with your battles. In closing, let's finish up this story. I'm out of time. Just to summarize here, verse 16, it said that Gideon divided the 300 up into three companies. And this is what they fought with, a trumpet, an empty jar, and a torch in the jar. That was, that was their weapons. And Gideon said, look, I'm, we're going to spread out. You do what I do. We're going to get together. We're going to blow these trumpets. We're going we're to smash the jars. We're going to light the torch. We're going to hold it up. That's what God's called us to do. So they did all of that. They spread out. 
In their left hand they held the torches, and in their right hands they blew the trumpet, and they cried out, A sword for the Lord and a sword for Gideon. And it says, Every man stood in his place around the camp, and all the army ran. They cried out and fled. The 134,000 fled. Because of trumpets, empty jars, and a torch. Can you believe it? Scholars and theologians say that the enemy was so confused and afraid that they turned on each other trying to escape and they killed each other. Isn't that crazy? Isn't that crazy? My question to you today, are you God-dependent or are you self-dependent? The miracle here today, God took 300 men and killed 134,000 with trumpets, empty jars, and torches. But here's the real, to me, the real miracle here is how God changed Gideon's life through his weakness and his dependence on God. Listen, God saw something in Gideon that he didn't see in himself. And God sees something in you that you don't see in yourself. And he sees something, God sees how you could be, not how you simply are. God sees you differently. And I know there's a lot of you listening in here today and you're listening online to this message and you're thinking, Pastor, that's such a cool little story you told this morning, but you have no idea the battle that I'm going through. You have no idea the pain and the hurt and the betrayal that I'm experiencing in my life right now. I'm hurting and I'm wounded and I'm bleeding and you have no idea and I got the scars to prove it. And for some of you, you've come to the end of your rope. But can I tell you something today? It's not the end of the road. It's just the end of how you envision your life to look like and to be, which is a beautiful position to be in because that's where God can meet you. There's power and strength and weakness. And maybe I don't understand your battle Maybe I don't understand your hurt, but God does. And I believe that sometimes God allows things in our life, those battles, those hurts, to lead us to a godly confidence and a godly dependence instead of a self-dependence. And if you're in a battle right now, it can't be any worse than 300 against 134,000. I want to I apply this real quick before we go. And I believe that the application here is that we all need to take some steps back to God, to being God-dependent and not self-dependent. And for some of us, we're hurting and we're wounded. And I just want to say that God is calling you to get bandaged up. Maybe for some of you, you need to get in a group so people can care for you and love you and walk with you in your battles. It's time to get outside of yourself and to get some help. And for some of you, maybe you're not in the 300 and God is calling you to get on a team and serve. To be able to use you to have an individual blessing in your life. For some of us, our problems are so bad that we need to just walk limp. We need to walk limping, walk wounded, and get some help and get some counseling. God wants us to come off the throne of our life and put some other people around us. My question this morning for you is who and how are you fighting your battles? Who and how are you fighting your battles today? 2 Corinthians 10.4 says, The weapons we fight with are not weapons of the world, but on the contrary, they have divine power to, to... demolish strongholds. So my question for you today is who is fighting your battles? This is a weapon of the world. Y'all see it? It's a weapon of the world and in the wrong hands it can cause irrevocable damage. Irrevocable damage. And right now for many of us you've got it, you've got your sword drawn 
and it's causing major damage in your life and it's causing major damage in the life of the people that you love. And I believe that the invitation today is very simple. It's very simple. I believe that the heart of God today for you and for me is to lay it down. And I believe that God is calling you and he's calling me to give him our battles. And I don't know what that looks like for you, but here's what I know. As long as you keep this drawn, you're going to lose. In your marriage, you got your sword drawn. With your finances and your friendships and your addictions and whatever it is, you've got your sword drawn and God is saying, you need to lay down your sword. You need to lay it down and give it to me. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, I thank you for your word today. And Lord, I pray that, uh, Lord, you would just take it. Lord, that you would use it. Lord, I'll just lift up each one in this room, those watching online today. Lord, we are all in a battle. Lord, we all have stuff in our lives. Lord, I, I just pray today that Lord, that people would be willing to deny themselves, that, that, Lord, they would just swallow their pride. Lord, that they would just get off the throne of their own life. And Lord, that they would be dependent on you for their battles. Lord, I just pray for each one that's in this room and online today. Lord, I pray that you would just use this time right now in this moment to minister to hearts. Lord, I know there must be somebody that's at the very end of their rope today. And Lord, they need you to come in into their lives. They need you to come into their battles. So Lord, I just ask that you can do only what you can do and meet them right where they are. If there's one today that don't know you as their Savior, I just pray today that Lord, they would turn them, their life over to you. That they would lay down their sword. Or that they would just ask you to come into their heart and just confessing their sin before you, believing that you died for them and rose again. If you're here today and you've never accepted Christ as your Savior, I want to give you that opportunity. Nobody's going to call you up front or embarrass you. But I do want to extend an invitation today if you're here for the first time or if you're here and you've never accepted Jesus in your life. You can do that today and you can do that just by slipping your hand up. Is there anybody here today that just wants Christ in their life? Maybe you're here and you have some battles going on. And God's calling you and he's moving in your life today to give them to him. Lord, I just lift them up to you. I pray right now that if there are those in here that need you, that they would just surrender today. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We pray all these things in Jesus' name. And all God's people said, amen, amen, amen. So, it's, um, continue to pray for our pastor as he's out um, the rest of this month. It's... Um, just want to continue to lift him up in prayer. It's time for our offering this morning. There's four ways to give. You can do that online through our website. Um, you can text or, or uh, text your tithe to uh, that text number on our line, or you can come and drop it off here at the church. And at this time, Kendra is going to come and share some exciting news with everybody yes. about the church and what's going on. So, Kendra, come. Thank, Thank you. Thank you, Pastor Sherman. You know, so many takeaways from that message, right? Oh my gosh, if you want to listen to that again, um, you can go to community, communitych.com and uh, it'll take you right to that message. Um, just click on the link and you can hear that again. Share it with your friends. So yes, we have some great things coming up at the church. First of all, next week um, is what? Father's Day. Come on, guys, it's Father's Day. So we want to take that day to celebrate and honor our dads and our father figures in our life. And one lucky dad is going to have a chance to win a $100 gift card to Gallagher's, right? Get a nice cowboy steak. So how, you, so how we're going to do this is come a little bit early, all you dads. 
we're going to have a cornhole challenge. You know, you got it? Anybody play cornhole? So we're going to have a cornhole challenge. You'll get your tosses outside, and we'll announce the winner um, during the service after everybody gets a chance to make their tosses in. So go home and practice. This is your chance, Chip, to practice. Next thing I want to tell you about is our blood drive. So important to give blood. You don't have to um, wear a cape to be a hero. All you have to do is donate blood. So on um, Sunday, June 27th, we are going to have our annual church blood drive. You can sign up um, by texting the word HERO to 985-260-8411. So it's real easy. And by the way, save that number in your phone because that is going to be our church text to number. And another thing you can text to that, if you're not a um, community group, a small group, it's a great way to uh, equip yourself, right? The Pastor Sherman just talked about it. You can also text the word group to 985-260-8411. Save that number because in a couple of weeks, we're going to use that number for VBS. All right, all you moms, you're on the edge of your seat. VBS, it's coming June, July 12th through 16th. Next week will be sign up, so you're going to be texting for that too as well, okay? You guys, enjoy your Sunday. Follow us on social media. We have Facebook, um, YouTube, as well as Instagram. So check us out, like and share us, okay? All right, well, have a wonderful day, church.